This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And this week we are joined by our former guest, Sarah Summer, who's filling in for both Nate and Patrick this week. Uh, Sarah is a composer living in Texas. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for being with us this, this evening. We're recording at an evening time. I'm very ba- glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, our guest is Alex Shapiro. Alex is a composer who lives, and we'll talk about this, lives on a, a, a tiny island off the coast of Washington. So, Alex, thank you for plugging into the Internet to be with us this, this evening. Delighted, delighted. <laughs> so, one of the reasons that... Uh, we first thought to have you on was that we saw uh, a blog post that you had written on Greg Sandow's blog. And in it, you describe uh, an experience. You had been living in Los Angeles and uh-huh. working as a composer, and you decided that you didn't want to do that very much anymore. So maybe you can just kind of tell that story a little bit uh, here. I think a lot of Angelinos can relate, actually. Yeah. I mean, it's no secret that the traffic there is is outrageously bad, and it's not going to get any better. I don't care about all the extra freeway lanes that they're building and all of that. Um, I had lived, actually, in L.A., believe it or not, for 24 years. And I'm, I'm originally from Manhattan. Sorry. I'm originally from Manhattan. I grew up there, lived there till I was 21. I'm certainly uh, no stranger to big cities. And in Los Angeles, I, for the last 15 years of those 24, I was living in the paradise of Los Angeles. I was living in Malibu. And I couldn't have had a better lifestyle, as far as I'm concerned, in L.A., living right on the beach. I had a double-wide mobile home. It was awesome. And I also had a sailboat up in Santa Barbara. And between, I called it Keel Estate and Real Estate. Well, no, what it was, Keel Estate and Wheel Estate. That's what it was. <laughs> And it was like living the dream, you know, on a low, low budget, low income, just a worker bee composer, having a great time, except for every time I left the boat or left the mobile home on the beach to get into town to, you know, go to concerts and, and run meetings and do all the things that one does as a, as a composer. And increasingly, it just became a, a major drag. And I just thought, it, this, is, this is way too stressful. In, and it's way too much of a... Um, cognitive dissonance between what my life is as an artist who is filled with openness and joy and lack of stress and happiness there on the beach and then getting behind the wheel of my car and doing battle <laughs> with you know <laughs> thousands of people and so I just figured at, at a certain point uh it, it seemed like an awfully good idea now this co this certain point coincided with a very important event in my life which was uh, getting to, to be invited to be a fellow at the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire and being able to spend a few weeks there working in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the woods. I mean, the people of Peterborough, New Hampshire, wouldn't call it the middle of nowhere. But, you know, it certainly wasn't Los Angeles. <laughs> and I, I had such a great time there. I came back to Los Angeles, to my beautiful place in Malibu. And I just, it started to dawn on me, you know, if I was so happy, as I said in, in the article I did for, for Greg Sandow, if I was so happy and creative and productive in a little tiny cabin in the woods in the middle of nowhere, why shouldn't my life look like that every day? Why should I have to wait to be accepted someplace or be given an opportunity? Uh, I believe in creating your own opportunities. And that's kind of a big theme, I think, in my life anyway, and in my work and my approach to my work. So... I created my own opportunity. After a while, um, a few years later, it just became clear that I was present enough on the internet, and I'm not a performing composer, which is actually a detriment. As uh, you know, it's much easier in in a career to be a performer and to have that much more access to the people that you work with. And uh, I realized I could live anywhere in the world, kind of spin the globe. And what's beautiful to me? What's compelling? And where don't I have to be on a freeway all the time just to be able to see friends or go to a concert or anything else? So I ended up just by a long story of of having run into a friend, a percussionist, uh, who was in San Francisco working there. And she and her husband had moved about a year earlier up to Salt Spring Island, which is in the southern Gulf Islands of Canada, not too far from here, about 12 miles away right across the border. Uh, San Juan Island is floating off the left-hand corner of the United States on the right on the Canadian border. And uh, I can, I can see Victoria from my house. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) so, so anyway, she said, come up and see us and, and check this out. We found paradise. And she was right. 
And so, uh, you know, after talking to an immigration attorney, to an immigration attorney, it became clear that, you know, as an American, it would take three years to get in. They really want artists that I would have had no problem getting in eventually, but it was going to take a long time. And I was so ready to just flip the switch and go. So that's how I discovered, you know, San Juan Island. And, uh, and here I am. So that's, it was sort of serendipity and just deciding, you know what, what's the worst thing that can happen? If it turns out to be a really big mistake and if my career tanks and, you know, just what was I thinking, I'll move somewhere else. You know, and I always tell my friends that and my, my colleagues, like nothing has to be a life or death decision. Just try something and see if it's, if it's going to fit. And I was just really lucky. It's been six years now, exactly six years. And uh, I moved here in May of 2007. So I, it just was a lucky fit. So that's sort of the long story, <laughs> David, how, no, I, how I left, you know, how I left L.A. and ended up in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> well, I think, I, like you said, I think a lot of Los Angeles, anybody that's lived in Los Angeles could relate to that. I've, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody that's lived in Los Angeles that has enjoyed living in Los Angeles. <laughs> they all hate it. Um, and it's and it, and it just it seems funny that it doesn't occur to more people to just go somewhere else i um, know well and especially now because we have the technology 20 years ago you, you couldn't not doing what we all do right it would have been much more difficult but now it's a whole new ball game so how do you how do you and you talked about this in in your piece but for for anybody in our audience that didn't read it how do you um maintain your career without having a, a, as many face-to-face -face meetings with people um it's, i assume it's a lot it looks a lot like this yeah, I was going to say it can look like this, although, frankly, you know what I do the most of, and this is very old school, I realize, uh, but I love email. You know, I happen to do it because in email I can share links, I can, I can share files back and forth, all of this stuff. So I do an awful lot of my work on email um, to the point where I actually make it clear on my answering machines, you know, if you really want to reach me, email me. I don't, don't even, you know, bother trying to reach me on the phone. Uh, that because I do travel a fair amount by choice, and that's uh, and and that means that email is always on my on my iPhone, and you know I can I can always be reached. But the way I I think that I deal with it living here is actually, and here's the secret, folks. It's not any different than the way anybody in the middle of Brooklyn or the middle of L.A. or the middle of London or wherever else would deal with it, which is you in 2013 and beyond, you have to be present online. And your online presence and whatever that is, is a 24-7, you know, virtual cocktail party, basically. And if you are putting yourself out there in many, many ways, video, audio, yourself, participating, and that's a key thing, participating online, it is hugely effective for building very real uh, relationships with people. And I come across this time and time again because every year, you know, throughout the year, I end up meeting people that I only knew in, uh, you know, in their online presence that we had for, for whatever many years been online, maybe first back in the days of MySpace and now on Facebook and whatever. And you meet each other and boy, you have a history. You really do know each other. You know each other's work. You know each other's background. If it's Facebook, you've seen all their vacation pics and all that stuff, you know, and <laughs> It's, it's, in, it's a very different paradigm than it ever was before. And I find it exceedingly thrilling. So I, I make full use of it. And again, it's not just because I happen to be living on this rock with a moat around it, you know, because San Juan Island has no bridge. And the only way to get on and off this island is by boat or by light plane, little tiny puddle jumper. So that's a commitment. That, but yeah. it, in a sense, I'm, I'm a good guinea pig for the philosophy. You know, if, if anybody's going to be a cheerleader about this, I guess I can come by it honestly and say, folks, if I can do this with, by the way, a really slow internet connection, incredibly slow, one and a half, <laughs> as wow. opposed to like a hundred which or fiber optic or something. But if, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And the rules of the game are the same. Participate and make yourself available and find other ways to, to, to engage with other people and find what they do really, really interesting. It's not just about us. You know, it's it, we're, we happen to be sitting wherever we're sitting, but it's this incredibly open door is how I perceive this technology. And I wrote another article uh, a few years ago, I think it was back in 2010, I think, uh, for New Music Box, where uh, I think the title is as important as the printing press. And it was, you know, my, my statement, we, I was talking about net neutrality and other things, but my statement was that this technology for 
this generation and beyond is absolutely as important as hundreds of years ago when the Gutenberg Bible and, and everything that came after it popped yeah. up. And when a printing press allowed the sharing of information, that's huge. And so now, you know, we're all addicted to the, to the web, right? Anytime we want to know something, you know, you're at the dinner table, oh, what's yada, 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 and everybody's whipping out their phone and typing it in or speaking it in, and boom, you got the answer. It's, and it connects people. And if you're connecting people, you're connecting culture, and you're growing your culture. So for artists, it's huge, huge. Never, there's never been a better time to be an artist. That's very exciting to hear you say that. I, I, w I would think that if I were in your situation, I would always be worrying because I always worry about everything anyway. But I would always <laughs> be worrying that I would be missing out on some, you know, face to face cocktail party experience, that, that there would be something, some opportunity or whatever that I would miss. But at the same time, I guess even if you're at that cocktail party, there's another place that you're not. I mean, you're, you're choosing your cocktail party and you have chosen a particularly enormous one, <laughs> a particularly <laughs> enormous and inclusive one. Um, so I suppose, but, I, I, are there, do you, are you, is that something that you, you're ever concerned about, is, is missing things? I, it never occurs to me what I'm missing, because I guess my, my uh, thinking is that I'm always on the creation end and always on the uh, uh, entrepreneurial side of making the opportunity, making whatever connections happen, just by making myself available, for one thing. But the, the other thing is, and this is also very key, I do think it's really great when artists can get involved in their community in a volunteer way, in a very real way, with organizations. And I have done that to a fairly well. I had certainly done that for years and years, long before I left Los Angeles. Um, I know I was president of the L.A. chapter of the American Composers Forum, and I was very involved in a slew of other organizations, you know, too long a list to mention. And even now, living here, I, you know, is my bio, people can read my bio and see that there are at least three large organizations that I'm very, very active with. And, and uh, that gives me an opportunity to fly out to New York or other places and, and, do, and have those face-to-face -face meetings. And I do think that that's important. I would never advocate that the, the net, fabulous as it is, is, is a substitute for the pheromonal contact with people. I'm a big one for pheromones. I really am. <laughs> but, but when pheromones just can't be exchanged, and just wait, I'm sure, you know, Bill Gates is probably working on that one. Um, but <laughs> until the days we can exchange pheromones through the screens or whatever, you know, in the air pointing thing we're going to be doing, uh, it's, a, it's a balance and it's a combination. And I, I think also... It's, I, I did happen to watch uh, a couple of your shows, and I, and I saw one where you were talking about my article a little bit, and when, when you didn't have a guest that week, a couple of weeks ago or something. Yeah. And you, and you made, or one, of the, one of the guys made a point of saying, wow, you know, this would be kind of hard to do, and, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, if you're Joe Schmo and not, um, you know, if you, if you don't have any connections in the business and you just decide, I'm just going to get out of school and, and go, you know, live on a desert island someplace. And I think that's very true. I was in, how old was I when I left? You know, I was 51. I was in my mid-40s. I can't do math very well. I was in my mid-40s when I left. So I already had a career, you know, uh, not a brilliant one, but, you know, I was, I was, I was working away. And so uh, that, I think, is a key thing, too. When you're 22, you don't necessarily want to be living on San Juan Island. But when you're 38, 42, whatever, you know, after you, after you, you do know a fair amount of people, in the real world, so to speak, and after you've done a lot of physical work building those relationships, whether it's backstage at concerts or volunteerism through organizations and running all kinds of events and doing really fun things, there comes a point, when, and, you, and you certainly don't have to be extremely well established for that point to come, where you can just say, I, I'd like my life to look like so-and-so. And, and again, we create our lives. We create what our days look like. And... You, we have to think if we're if we're sensitive at all to our environments, and not everybody is. But I'm hypersensitive to mine. And if if you're that kind of person, then it makes sense to be able to direct your own life and say, okay, what makes me the happiest? What do I? What gives me great joy to be surrounded by? And the answer is different for everybody. And for some people, it is going to be the middle of Brooklyn or whatever. And that's great. You know, it's not a value uh, judgment at all, one way or the other. And one's not better than the other. But it, again, it comes back to the freedom and that sense of control that we have as artists to be able to say now, I don't any longer have to live in an expensive city. 
I mean, listen, San Juan Island is a third of my expenses here are easily a third of what they were in Los Angeles. And I'm living like a queen, you know, in this amazing area. Yeah. And uh, it, it's it, to me, economically, it's really, really important to talk about this stuff in terms of how technology affects the income and, and economics for artists and for anybody else. But we're talking about artists in this case that they have the choice to say, I don't want to pay $3,000 a month rent someplace, <laughs> you know, in New York or whatever. I don't, I don't want to have to be scrambling and have to have a second job, you know, to, to be able to make my way as a composer. I, I want to live more within my means. How can I do that? Well, this technology has now given us the chance. That's great. Um, <laughs> that one thing, actually, that, that you mentioned in your piece, and I think your cocktail analogy just now really points to, is the importance and this is something that comes across a lot in your you know web presence is a personality and a lot of people have their web presences and they're very dry and kind of the, the they're just professional i i don't want to use professional as though it's a bad thing but there's there's not a lot of depth to what yeah. they're what what they're putting as representing themselves um, and it, one thing that I really like about your web presence is that it does feel very personal. It feels very, um, you know, homemade and do it yourself in a very good way. And you, you have your blog notes from the kelp, I always think is great with the photos of the, of the creatures and all the, all the things in your environment. My mother's a, a biologist and she would love oh, going through great. some of that. Those, like, that's the same thing that if I were going for a walk with my mother that she would stop me and point out when I was a kid. Right. So uh, it's, it's great to, to, to read those kinds of things. And I wonder how you feel about... Um, I mean, obviously, those are fun things for you. I wonder how you feel about their connection to your your career. Oh, I think it's enormous, and I think you really you said it at the beginning of, of your statement that to to lend a personal connection to the work that you do uh, in this day and age. Well, it's probably always been true, but boy, is it true now. You know, it's it's a really great thing that there are tens and tens and tens of thousands of composers out there. That is a fabulous thing, and we should celebrate that. But then the question becomes, OK, there are tens and tens of thousands of composers out there. Well, every one of them, I like to jokingly say, we're all like snowflakes. Everyone is different. But if that's the case, and we hope it's the case, certainly in art music, it's the case, because otherwise we would be doing other kinds of music that, you know, is, where you don't have to sound quite so much like yourself. But in concert music, the whole point is to sound like you as authentically as you can, whatever that means. And in that case, well, the web presence for the Eunice should be as real and as personable and as um, intimate in a sense, not in terms of divulging your personal life and personal secrets, but intimate in a connective way, as you would be uh, in person talking to somebody. I, I very strongly feel that when people have a connection to us as, as humans, uh, whether it's, let's say, my love of squishy things from the ocean or someone else's Lego collection or whatever their thing is, when they have a, a, you know, a connection to the things that we find interesting, they're all, automatically that gives them a backstory and a, and a greater affinity to the music that we create and more of an interest, at least for a second, in clicking and checking out that music. I, I feel that it's just a human rule of thumb about affinity and connection. And one of the problems that a lot of people, not just artists, but a lot of people in this world have is maybe they take themselves a little too seriously. <laughs> and life is too short to take yourself that seriously. I think if you're just having a good time, pursuing the things that you love, and smiling a fair amount, you know, then, then people are going to connect with that and want to maybe jump on board and see what else are you about. And that is where the music comes in. I mean, sometimes, sure, they're going to hear the music first and then find out who you are and wh what makes you tick. But a lot of the times in a, in a web environment, it's, it's the opposite. Because we don't hear something first. We see it. Except for those horrible sites where music initially starts playing and you have to oh. frantically, you know, don't you hate that? Yeah. And you have to frantically go, where the heck is the, you know, off button or mute, mute, mute. Um, that, that's like, those should be outlawed. <laughs> but, uh, but we, you know, we're visual people. And we see yeah. things on the web before we hear them. So if we are what they're seeing, that's, that's something to think about. And I, it's the same thing, frankly, with live performance. I, I've been talking about this more and more, about how 
in a in an age where everybody is tethered to a screen, you know, whether it's their laptop or their smartphone or whatever, everybody's looking at screens all the time and they're visual. And then they go to a concert and sit there nice and quietly and and they're staring at a stage and there are three people on the stage just you know, sawing away, doing their thing, and not a hell of a lot else is happening, except hopefully great music. But I think that we have to think visually as performers, too, in this day and age, when it comes to concerts and presentations, that it is very multimedia at this point. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you mentioned something. We, when we talk about social media on this show, one thing that comes up a lot is how people are not very, don't use it for, for its best right. uses. Um, you know, there are people that just kind of push out to kind of treat it like like direct mailing or something, you know, push out to everybody that that follows them on Twitter, or everybody that follows them on Facebook, you know, hey, I got a show coming up on uh, eight, eight o'clock on Friday, you should be there. And that's the only time they ever use it. Um, but the thing that it's really good at is connecting people to other people and not people to brands or people to organizations, but people to other people. Um, so anyway, it's, it's really nice to, to hear you say some of those things. Uh, Sam, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I think, uh, it's what's striking to me is one of, one of the, the biggest aspects of having, uh, doing a lot of your work as a composer, and that includes, you know, basically the networking aspect of it online is that, you know, everybody nowadays deals with linear and nonlinear communication. And if you live in Los Angeles, usually you instigate a series of nonlinear communications by having one encounter that is a protracted over a martini or whatever linear encounter, you know, and that starts it. Um, so just getting rid of that seems to me like in a, in a lot of ways, especially considering more and more people are going to become more receptive to uh, sort of uh, becoming engaged with one another in this way, it seems like it's more efficient not having to get up and go to the club or go to the after party or the whatever. And uh, doing it online is more efficient in a lot of ways the same way nonlinear communication is very efficient, if, you, if that makes any sense. Um, and, and, and along those lines, I, I'm always harping about education. So I'm going to put my two cents in worth of where the composers need to be trained more about how to create a cohesive and, uh, you know, personality rich online identity for exactly the reasons you've been talking about here. They've got to, you know, they've got to get people to engage with them and they've got to have some idea about how to accomplish that using these tools. And, and the sad part is I know lots of composers who, don't care and aren't very good at it, but um, when you understand what the tools are and how you might go about using them, I think it's sort of a composerly activity. You're looking at a media type and you're like figuring out what to do and how using the tool might affect people and what they think about something. So I think composers are a natural for this kind of activity. I think you're absolutely right. Creativity is creativity. And our job description is to be creative. That's what we're hired to do. That's what we're out there trying to do. And, uh, and just seeing it in a more three-dimensional way, not thinking so limitedly about ourselves as our job description is, oh, I just align notes. I often call myself a note aligner because <laughs> that describes it well. But, um, but that's not all you do. And we all know that now. This, this really, it actually connects very well to something I've been giving a lot of thought about the past couple of days because of some comments that I've read on other blogs about art being an artist these days and promotion and so many artists do have a problem with promotion self-promotion and I don't mean that in a crass use of the word I just mean it in a way of you know how to get yourself out there and that is a, a growing issue that has to be addressed I might even write another essay about it or something because it used to be to, again more than 20 years ago um it used to be that artists didn't have to do so much self-promotion because there wasn't the desktop publishing. We weren't self-publishing in any large numbers. You had a publisher. You had an agent. You had other people doing this stuff for you. And your job was to you know, brush your hair, at least in the right direction, so you could stand up and take a bow and look reasonably not scary, although some composers still look kind of scary. And I, I'm one of those early in the morning. But that's all our job description was like, write the music, you know, someone else gets it out there for you, makes the context, sets up, you know, all the stuff and, and you just show up and bow. 
uh, boy, gone are those days. I mean, sure, that's part of the job description. That's about one fiftieth about of what we do. And uh, I think that the the challenge now, as you're saying about uh, Sam, about how how is it to think in a broader way about one's web presence and, and as a composer that you're not just writing notes, you're telling a story and drawing people into your life. I also think that this is a new part of our job description now with self-publishing, which so many of us, you know, are doing now. That is much more the norm and, and much more the expectation. We are now responsible for the promotion of our work because that's what the publishers used to do. So if that's the case, if the paradigm, once again, has shifted entirely, then it's incumbent on us to, to embrace it and to look at it carefully and say, you know what, just because 25 years ago I might have been taught in school in conservatory or something, you know, this is how it's done. Guess what? Game over. Not, not anymore. It's not. And I think it's, it's a little bit like pulling teeth with some composers, and I'm trying to find gentle ways to invite them in to thinking about their careers in this very abundant and three-dimensional, multi-dimensional way. Yeah, and, and Sam, you mentioned um, the educational aspects of it, and Alex, some of the things you said reminded me of this as well. You mentioned how much easier your career is for if you were, if you would be also a performer, um, mm -hmm. and I think one of the reasons that it, it it could be easier is that it's a little bit easier to explain what you do. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I think the web is great at is demystifying what we do. Like, I think it's very easy for people who are not composers to think of composers as these special magic privileged people that get to do special magic privileged things. Ooh. And I, yeah, exactly. There's like this very, you know, witchcraft thing to making music and it's really i i try to express to people all the time it's really not that it's as far it's as, the, as opposite from that as it could possibly be <laughs> um and i think that's it's something that, that both of you guys are kind of touching on there what, what, well go ahead sam it's interesting that you know oh. um oh, for instance geez. i played i played disc golf today which i got to do because we recorded <laughs> at six instead of in the morning and it was awesome but invariably, I'll meet people disc golfing who want to know, what do you do? And if you say, I'm a composer, what's the first question? What kind of music do you write? Yeah. Exactly. No, even worse than that, Sam, I mean, to interrupt, they say, music? I mean, that, they, before even what kind of music, they always say, music? Like, what other kind of composing is there? Anyway, go back. I don't even <laughs> right. know what, how to answer that question, though. Sam, maybe that's where you're headed. Yeah, well, I, on this golf course, I'm kind of like, uh, okay. I usually say something like, it's, you know, weird kind of modern concert music that you probably wouldn't like. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> yes, I know. But I'm, I'm just trying to get the guy to leave me alone so I can throw my upshot, you know. <laughs> but my, if, if I had this in my hand and a Wi-Fi connection, like, the idea of explaining that question becomes a completely different matter, you know. I can send them to a screen or even show them my screen and all of a sudden you've got all these rich uh all this rich content to explain what kind of music it is you do write. Um so this or, enigmatic question that is impossible to answer turns into something that is very very easy to answer. Or you can just give them the very easy, simple and probably truthful uh response. What kind of music do you write? Oh, wonderful music. <laughs> You can just say, or, or when That's they say, good. "What is your music? What does your music sound like?" Sounds wonderful. Sounds great. <laughs> you you know, I decided actually just now, I have won some composition awards. You know, nothing big, but I'm gonna from now on say award winning. There you go, award winning. There you go, award winning music. That. That's what I write. You know, b both of you kind of just touched on something that always I, I've never quite understood. Um, and and Alex, you phrased it the way that I hear it the, the most. Um. When it, when I talk to young composers, student composers, one thing that I, they ask a lot is, "How do you get your name out there?" And I don't know what that. For the life of me, I have no idea what that means. I don't know where out there is and what <laughs> it what your name is going to do when it gets there. So maybe you could explain <laughs> to me what what you mean by that uh, when when you say that. I love that out there. Where is out there, and is there an off ramp? Right. And uh, you know, a porta potty or how does, something. How does Gee. my name get it? <laughs> really, <laughs> I love that. Well, I'm kind of out there. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm up here. You know, up at the 
north north end of nowhere. Yeah, there's that um, kind of out there. That's kind of kind of out there. Uh, <laughs> you know, it gets back to the web presence thing because this this is an old an old thing that ever ever since the days of newspapers, which is a long time now, when people see something in print, they believe it. Now, this is a very bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's really dumb, but it happens to be psychologically true to this day and age. It's true. I mean, how many things do we have to go to Snopes.com, you know, to demystify, right? Because we see something in print and we wonder, could it actually be true? Um, th there is truth to this that when they see it in print, it becomes it becomes uh, authentic and uh, it becomes something trusted, in, uh, at least for a brief moment. Well, when you're using social media, when you're participating on blogs and commenting, when you are being part of the community and your name is following you and your comments everywhere, usually with a, a link to your website, suddenly you are in print and you are getting your name out there, whatever out there is, you're out there because you don't know who is clicking on those links and where everything's going and some things only three people in a dog read and other things, you know, 30,000 people are going to be reading and you never know which is which necessarily. And that is the key. When something is in print, and in this case we're talking about your name on a screen, suddenly you're out there. And then you want to back that up, right, with having the, a good web presence that pe when people click on your name, they're going to be taken on this journey to everything that you're about, uh, which is the importance of, of web, uh, you know, web presence done in, in the right way. And I can tell you endless personal stories about how this has not only been a joyous and fun thing, but also very, very remunerative for me that, you know, you, I'll take a moment to just put a comment up someplace on something and sometimes somebody will click on it who had never heard of me before you know Alex Shapiro who's he let's see and you know and they and they click and suddenly next thing I know I've got you know a big commission or this or that I mean it's it happens and this is again why I'm such a cheerleader for this with my colleagues saying you know if this stuff is happening to me on a very regular basis there's no reason it shouldn't be happening to lots of people Right. And it's something right. that, that people who don't live on remote islands can do, too. That's like, my whole point. You know, exactly. All I am is the guinea pig, you know, the right. canary in the coal mine. <laughs> well, with the out there thing, I was thinking about it, is when I think of your name being out there, out there maybe to a lot of people that read about new music on the Internet might perceive the out there as somewhere in the vicinity of Manhattan. Um, <laughs> and... You know, I, I feel sometimes maybe, I mean, you're obviously very isolated uh, from a lot of, geographically anyway, from a lot of new music stuff. And, you know, I'm in a an extraordinarily unhip part of Florida, and Sam lives in Lansing, Michigan, and Sarah, you live in Denton, right? You're, you're, you're yeah. In yeah. Small, Which small I've heard is Texas. I've heard that Denton is just as hip as East Lansing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but wait a minute, you guys are in university towns, and so that's hugely hip. I mean, you have your own tide pool, and it's a really big one in both cases. True. That's true. Um, Very different. Yeah. But, it, but my, my point is that it, it often, you know, without being quite so obvious geographically, can feel culturally like it's uh, nearly as isolated as living on an island that doesn't have a bridge to it, you know? So I think that's one really interesting thing uh, that I think we can all learn from your experience of being geographically isolated in 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 a way that we are not, but maybe culturally isolated or or br bridging that to be culturally connected in a way that that we all could very easily, just as easily, do. Mm -hmm. So. Sarah, I, I hope we're not like stepping all over any all of your interesting <laughs> questions. I feel like we've just kind of been ignoring you. <laughs> Hi, <sorry>. Sarah. <laughs> I Hi, do, I, that's Sarah. I have one question, and I'm enjoying the conversation. Um, first of all, Alex, I'm incredibly inspired by um, your idea of you know creating your own opportunity and just sort of envisioning how you want your life to be and just making it that way. Um, I, um, I know that sometimes, you know, I, social networking tools, I, you know, start out using them as, you know, I use them as tools, but some days I start to feel like uh, it's using me. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
uh, I just recently finished my dissertation, and all all of my PhD friends have gone through the the Facebook time suckage. You know, whenever we get stuck, and I was wondering if you. Um, you know, have a way of um, sort of compartmentalizing your um, internet activity and um, and your actual work as a composer, if you have any advice about that. Yeah, that's a great question, Sarah, because I think everybody deals with that. And I, I can just tell you what I do and what I sometimes suggest is treat your writing time, because that's really what we're talking about preserving, because there's endless time for the web. The web is a place that never ends. There is no off-ramp. There, there, it's out there without an inside there, you know? But what we have to preserve is our composing time and, other th and family time and whatever, playing with the cat time or whatever you need to do that isn't online. Yeah. And uh, I treat my writing time very much like an appointment that I would have with anybody else. In other words, if, I, if you and I had a dinner date, unless we're gonna have dinner on Tuesday, you know, I wouldn't bail on that. Of course, I'd be there at 7.30 at the restaurant and meet you. Well, I make those kinds of blackout, you know, times for myself in my calendar. And sometimes, I, if, when, especially when I'm really nearing the end of a delivery of a piece and have to push something out the door, I'll take three days and nights and, and literally just not respond to things very much <laughs> and uh, maybe check email once. And, uh, and, you know, remember, I'm running a publishing company, too. And so what that means is also realizing that things can wait two or three days if they really have to. You know, the world is not going to stop spinning on its axis. So co cordoning off time for yourself to, as a scheduled thing is really, really helpful. I do this now more often instead of three days and nights in a row. What I usually do is during the day. And sometimes I'm not successful at this. Some days just get away from you with a lot of stuff coming at you from all sides. But on more normal days, uh, it's really helpful to say, to carve out where, when your writing time is going to be. Some people are morning people, some people are late night people, you know, whatever it is, and protect that time. And when it's time to start writing, you turn off the computer. Sometimes it's not enough to have it on in the background so you can just kind of keep checking because that's sort of a, a mental uh, suck. We all know that. It's best to just turn that computer off and uh, or that or that program if you're not using two different computers and just focus on on the work without worrying about the outside world. So it's very much an on off switch. And I think that's the only way to effectively deal with it, because what I find multitasking, which is, of course, what we're all doing anyway, it's our job description, is it's very draining. It's very hard. And ultimately, the art of, of being a composer, of sharing your heart with listeners with musicians who are going to be playing it that is an extremely personal personal and undistracted activity it is it's it's sort of like in therapy if you went to see a therapist to talk about you know your issues you wouldn't hopefully be online all the time while you're talking about your issues right you'd, you'd be you'd put your phone away for those 50 very expensive minutes and you would talk only to the therapist and I think that, in a sense, that's what our art is. I, I've just made this analogy up on the fly, but it seems to work for me. <laughs> it's like, just pay attention to the thing that matters the most. Same thing in our relationships, right? You wouldn't be rude to a friend or a lover and just turn, a, turn away from them in mid-sentence <laughs> and check your, you know, whatever's going on and, and leave them trailing off. No, you give people their, your full attention. So we deserve to give our work our full attention, and that's a matter of scheduling it. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's a helpful answer or not. Well, I think that the thing that really resonated with me um, from what you just said is um, keeping an awareness of, you know, this doesn't have to be done right now. Because that's usually what, what pulls me away is, oh, that uh, that's a potential collaborator is trying to contact me. I better answer her right away. And, um, you know, and sometimes that may be true, but... I think that the best opportunities <laughs> um, you can stand to to at least wait five hours until I'm <laughs> I'm done writing for the day. Well, That's and it's exactly so tempting it. because you know responding to a, a an email is so much easier than writing a dissertation. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's true. <laughs> Well, that's there's the a, there's a task I can get done in 10 minutes. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, listen, we all are experts at the art of procrastination. But 
um, I, you know, which which can be called anti procrastination because <laughs> it's not pro, it's not helpful sometimes. <laughs> but it is helpful because our muses, we all know this. The the music's getting done in the subconscious when we're vacuuming, right? When we're brushing our teeth, when we're making dinner, when we're, whatever we're doing. Right. The the mm-hmm. music is getting done when we are answering those silly easy emails, and there is a certain amount of that that is very very good for the psyche. And I think it becomes a self-policing thing. And Sarah is already, uh, she, you know this, you know, it's a self-policing thing of, okay, where do you draw the line between what is uh, good, legitimate procrastination in the name of my muses versus what is BS procrastination in the name of, you know, being a tree sloth and not doing the work that needs to get done. And, and I also started, I, I am a bad procrastinator sometimes. And because there's always a lot of other stuff to do, you know, there's so many things, so many hats we're all wearing, right? And I, when I start to stress over looking at the list of things and realize, realizing that the most important thing still hasn't gotten done when it's really the first thing I should have done when I woke up, and I say to myself, Alex, what are you getting out of this? Why are you creating stress for yourself? What are you getting out of this by, by doing this? And that's a very tough question to ask yourself. And there's usually not a good answer. Like, why are you making yourself feel bad? <laughs> well, <laughs> and then when I, that helps me actually. So I recommend it to you guys, you know, a little self-reflection of why are we stressing ourselves when we don't have to? I used to say that in LA about traffic. When traffic got so bad, uh, the fat, last few years that I was there, I ended up starting to be much later. I used to be very prompt and I tend now to be very prompt to things. I hate being late. And I started being really kind of late, 15 minutes late to everything. And that was annoying the heck out of me. And finally, I realized it was my problem, right? I wasn't leaving. I hadn't taken into account the extra time that it now took to get around Los Angeles. Hello. And I wasn't giving myself time to get out the door soon. And so once I realized I'm responsible for my stress, boom, (laughs) I started being prompt or even early. So That's good. Um. Alex, I have a question that, that might be too, be too big for four lowly um, comp- composers to unpack. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, this week in New Music Box, um, Ellen McSweeney wrote an article, and I think we all read it. Uh, the Power List, Why Women Aren't Equals in New Music Leadership and Innovation. Um, well, if you're talking about new music, we've already talked about how you kind of create your own opportunities is really kind of the new paradigm in doing that. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts. Now, this is like, you know, anthropology dissertation kind of science topic. But um, so do you think that uh, in as much as, you know, women might be discouraged from even thinking that they should ask for things or thinking that they should deserve this opportunity and that kind of idea, do you think that shifting to an online presence and the use of social media has any uh, effect on the way women uh, uh, view themselves as composers and self-advocates vis-a-vis the use of social media, if that makes any sense at all? I would hope that it does because, again, we're giving everybody, I mean, not just women, men too. I mean, to me, it's an equal question, but I know what you're talking about. We'll get into the women thing in a second. But um, when you have this equal access equal to anybody who's in a really big publishing company and equal, if you're a woman, equal to any guy, equal to anybody out there, right? That's that out there thing. We're going to just call this whole episode out there. Um, if, Done. It, it, <laughs> that, there's no way that these tools cannot help uh, break down any kind of reservations that if we're talking about women, which, you know, is, I always cringe about that, I have to say, because I see them, and I said this uh, on another comment, I see it really as an individual psychology issue that affects men and women, and proportionately probably more women. So yeah, we'll talk about women. But just know that from here on out, anytime I use the term women, I only mean some women. I don't mean all women. Um, That's one of my problems with articles in general, when they talk about women this, women that. Of course, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense any more than the terms the black community or the gay community makes sense. You know, there is no community of, you know, everybody who's black or gay or, or left-handed or a woman is all like-minded, right? It's a uh, difficult language. Anyhow, right. I'm getting off the point. The point is we have a- equal access to the tools and we need to use them. The deeper point is, the, que- the question is, and Ellen is raising this uh, in her very fine article, what are the things holding women, some women, back? from doing this. 
And that's where the individual psychology came, comes from. Uh, Alexander Gardner, a wonderful composer wrote, who also writes for New Music Box, wrote a sort of a response essay on the blog side of New Music Box, and you guys may have seen it, where I did put in a comment on that one. Uh, and she says, she points to, as Sam just said, uh, a lot of women have a hard time asking for what they need and what they deserve and what they should get professionally. I think that's very, very true. Again, I have come in direct contact with countless men who have the same problem, whether they're 20 years old or 65 years old. So to me, again, this is a psychology problem. And it's sort of this, I'm an artist and kind of like what you slipped and said, Sam, oh, what I do, nobody would want to hear. Right. I'm going to so beat you up on that. Never, ever, ever do that. Why the hell are you doing it if no one else wants to hear it? Don't be so negative. Come on. We are artists. Everybody's got somebody out there who's going to want to hear what you do. And the great thing about these tools is that it gives us the chance to find that fan base. And by putting ourselves out there and also by by using the tools, you know, in a very um, uh, interactive and assertive way. And you will find the people who like your stuff, Sam, just like I find people who like my crazy stuff and David does and everybody does. Sarah, I I'm especially you know. tortured. I don't feel like I'm doing my job unless everybody hates it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then there, you, you know, you've just for me, you've just pegged yourself as a really great web presence. That could be your shtick right there. <laughs> Right. Because if this, if, if you are now known as the composer that just feels like it's not any good unless no one wants to hear it, man, that's a, that's great branding <laughs> right there. That is immediately going to send me to your website to click and listen because you're challenging me to hate it. So that's really cool, actually. You just challenged me to hate your music, which I don't think I'm going to. So, um, and I always say, listen, I always say about my own stuff. I never ever expect everybody to like everything that I've done. You know, I, I fully expect people. So you go, eh, you know, but, but there's, a, but I also fully expect, I'm, I'm such an optimist, right? I always figure there's at least one person out there in the world who will like something I just slaved over, at least one. So usually there's a few more for all of us. Yeah. So, it, so back to the, the some women issue is, yes, it's, it's very much to me a great, great gift to have, if you, in a sense, it's the anonymity. It's the opposite of what we've been saying that the internet is in terms of a very personal connection. If you want it to be, it also is sort of this arm's length uh, way of separating yourself just enough to feel okay typing email asking. I am actually a great example of this because as outgoing as I am, um, I'll tell you something. I was never good at cold calling and still am not. I, I don't care for the telephone. Obviously, I have no speaking problem. Frankly, you can't shut me up. That's my problem, right? But I, for some reason, calling somebody that I don't know, I find very uncomfortable. However, I can email them without any uh, difficulty whatsoever. And in fact, that's how I set up a lot of my distribution deals and all sorts of things. Sending a cold, professional email, cold meaning not knowing them, not you know, cold hearted, uh, with a link, you know, and, and that's it. I have no problem doing that. So if I'm a test case woman, well, then the internet was a great tool for me. But again, I never thought it was a female thing. For me, it's just a personality thing. I'm shy. I have, an, I have a shy side. So that's, that's, yes, the answer is the internet absolutely helps some women. Well, I'm, I'm going to, I have one uh, sort of like a caveat, I think, sure. about um, using these modern communications technologies for women. Um, well, I'm sure there's studies out there that talk about this a great deal, but as an example, um, you know, studies have shown that girls in school are less likely to engage with math, as an example. So the first problem is we're not teaching kids very effectively, probably, how to use these tools in general. So they're kind of being taught, you know, on the street or just the culture that they're in is teaching them how to use it. So I wonder about how girls are being taught to use this technology versus how boys are being taught to use this technology. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, what's it good for? Right. It's good for communicating with your girlfriends and giggling, or is it good for uh, making strong, meaningful connections and engaging with potential collaborators as a broad stroke example? Uh, ultimately, in any in anything of what people are taught, it's going to be up to them, the individual again, to decide. Well, I might be in the in some you know backwater place that is treating the boys with a lot more favorability in my math class or history class or science class, you know, than or carpentry class, you know, than they're treating the girls. But if I you know that child, you know, if I, if I find something interesting, 
And hopefully, if I'm lucky enough, and not all are, to have parents that at least won't thwart it, much less if I'm really lucky and have people, you know, parents that would support my interests, I can choose to, to take an interest in this on my own, even if I've got jerks as teachers, which is really what it comes down to in education. There are still endless horror stories out there, without question, of young girls being treated terribly in, in classes, in schools. And there are horror stories of their parents treating them terribly and making it clear to them that they have no right to be anything other than a this or a that or whatever. You know, they keep them down. Without question, this is going on. I am so amazingly lucky because I, came, I grew up in a big city with very, very forward-thinking parents and never once from a teacher or a parent was it ever questioned that I could do anything I wanted to do. The message was always, you can do anything you want as long as you're good enough. In other words, the, the responsibility was me and, and makes perfect sense to all of us, right? So I think getting back to what you were saying, Sam, about the question of if, if the educational system continues to uh, be biased against young women and make things even very difficult for them actively, in some cases it still does, then that's where personal psychology comes back in, is we have to find ways to bolster the, self, the sense of self-worth of these individuals. And this is, I wrote this uh, point in response to Alex Gardner's uh, wonderful article about, uh, you know, on New Music Box about asking, you know, why are women afraid to ask? And it really comes down to a lack of self-worth. So once we can attack that, we can and, and make people understand that what they do is worth something and that they are worth something, then they're going to feel much more comfortable putting themselves out there. So that's the first step. And, and I think tricky. the problem is that that's a much harder problem to solve. Like mm -hmm. these, these more systemic, cultural, deeper psycho psychological problems are much more difficult to solve because I think we all know intellectually that there are, uh, you know, inappropriate behaviors that uh, and, and we know that, that, that certain things are wrong. You know, if you're on a committee that's awarding a commissioning grant or something and you're there's nobody on that commissioning grant committee that's saying well we should give this grant to this white guy instead of a woman or a hispanic composer like that 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 as far as i know i i maybe i'm being naive that doesn't happen um but yet the result of that that would come from that is what we're still seeing so i think that's that's harder to to say uh, what, a, how you solve that problem. Right. And the, the way you solve the problem is uh, you make it, you, you do whatever you can in terms of outreach. And this is through organizations and grant making organizations and everything else to make sure that women and women students in the case of, you know, grants that college students and conservatory students would apply for know that this exists and they should uh, apply. I mean, one of the striking things that has been coming up in these new music box articles is that, very, very unfortunately, women still are not applying for things in the in the uh, number that men are, and it's not because they're being thwarted. <laughs> it's because you know we're, the door is wide open. So that and that leads actually to a much bigger issue. You know, I'm I'm like the ultimate capitalist composer, right? I I am I'm, I'm certainly fine with grants, but I don't think that's a good thing to ever focus on. That's like being. Uh, that's winning the lottery. It's it's right. complete. It talk about not being in control of your career. <laughs> I think it's really important to not teach young women or young men to apply for all these grants and rely on grants. I think it's really important for us to teach them about copyright and publishing and web presence and other ways to make themselves a commodity in the best of ways because they are the product. Their relationships that they build with people are what are going to propel their careers and earn them income from their music, male or female. And if we can teach them these things, they are not going to have to have their hands out for grants. Uh, I can tell you personally, while I have certainly received some grants over the course of years, if you look at my bio, there are very few of them. Uh, I, I really am not in that uh, game at all, I have, or hardly at all. And I, I think it's a terrific gift, and I'm not dissing grants at all. Um, it's a wonderful thing and very necessary, but it's not something that we should be teaching artists to focus on. And it, it puts you in a very weak position to have your hand out uh, as though you were a child asking your parents for an allowance money. You know, it's, it, it, that's a, the weakest position you can be in. The strongest position you can be in 
is creating something, get, having a sense that it has some worth and finding a nice way to share it with people to the point where they're going to want to pay for it and interacting with people who will pay for what you do. And that's all self-generated. So. And I think the web and the DIY movement are making those things much more um, viable than they would have been even even just 10 years ago, which, is, which is really exciting. Hugely. I mean, that's just it. We keep coming back to this tool, this new, relatively newfound tool of, you know, less than 20 years, really, of um, the power of the web for self-creation, for yeah. self-control. I mean, for self-determination, for manifesting everything that you want your life to look like. Like. I mean, I make it sound like it's this magic potion, but it, it really can be. I'm a, I'm a big, maybe it's because I fried my brains in Southern California for 24 years. All that sunshine made me into one of these woo-woo people that actually firmly believes in visualizations. That if you really, if you're good at something, let's start with that. You have to have some modicum of talent. But if you're, if you're decent at something, and if you really, really want something, and if you can visualize to the point of tasting it what it is you want to achieve, then I don't see any reason why you can't have that or at least be in the running for it or come up with other things that are pretty close to being as good. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm just a big one for that because that's how I've been living. And you know, look at me, I'm goofy and happy. So. <laughs> well, and, and, and to, to return to um, the Ellen McSweeney piece and the Alex Gardner piece, um, I, I think some of these systemic problems are happening even before we get to that point of of composers making careers for themselves or getting grants or ho however like b bef before we even are considering ourselves you know artists in in that mm -hmm. regard how many women are even choosing composition i think is a is a problem i don't know sarah what is your experience in the the studio at unt are, are there are, are there a lot of women in your composition studio there uh during no no it's it's about i guess 15 percent, and this is a very big department um the only thing i noticed that i think is interesting is that um you the you know i'm i'm i've been at the um, university of north texas and they have a very large composition department the mm -hmm. departmental meetings have tip weekly departmental meetings typically have 50 60 students in there, um, most of whom are taking the um, uh, first year class composition course. And a lot of them are not going to be music, uh, composition majors. But I see that the, the dropout rate for female students in those classes is much lower than male students. Um, so basically, if she decides, yes, I want to do this, she's serious about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, and more likely to stick it out through graduation. Um, but, yeah, this is something that I've never complete. I mean, I kind of understand it because I feel that it took me longer to sort of make the connection that, because I am a human being, I can write music that I don't have to be a dead white European male. <laughs> and um, of course, it'd be hard to write music if I were dead. But um, <laughs> you'd have already written it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, but that's because I'm I'm from you know I, I studied piano and violin and learned classical music and loved classical music from an early age. And now, it, like at UNT, there are a lot more um, composition students coming from playing in rock bands or, um, you know, composing electronically more pop music on their laptop, but they want to go a more artistic route. Um, and maybe this goes back, Sam, to education, technology education, and making sure that the longstanding gender gap, gap in the field of technology doesn't continue. I mean, we have so many much more user-friendly applications. There's no reason for anyone to be intimidated uh, from creating using technology. Right. Uh, so 
yeah, but I, I don't see as many um, undergraduate composition students coming in having already used um, a uh, having already used technology to create music. There's an interesting anecdotal point here. I think um, I think even you know a, a university music department is I think it's safe to say typically going to be a pretty liberal environment. Um, However, there's still an old boys club component there, and I would say <laughs> oftentimes in composition studios. Um, and I wonder if that's very off-putting for female students that come in. And anecdotally, I would note in the uh, Ellen's article, she notes that at Pitchfork Media, which is a, you know, sort of an indie classical, that's what they focus on, Six of the 40 staff writers are women. However, two-thirds of the interns are female. So there's definitely an interest, especially seemingly in that approach to the whole thing, which they're reinventing something that exists outside of the old boys club of you know academic music. So that, that's interesting to me. And, and um, then it would be really interesting to ask those interns, especially the ones that don't go on to hire positions at, at either at Pitchfork or elsewhere, why did, what other choices did they make? Because uh, who knows, you know, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I'd love to know what other choices were they making? Um, because I, 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 I am very naive when it comes to this stuff, because I can tell you honestly, in my entire life, I've never experienced a shred to my knowledge of discrimination or gender discrimination. And so I'm always thinking, especially now at a place like Pitchfork and what Ellen describes, it just doesn't sound like it would be filled with these, you know, cretins <laughs> that would be, um, you know, horrible to, to these younger women interns. So I wonder what the reasons are. And maybe they get better opportunities elsewhere. Maybe they decide, as any composer should, you know, self-evaluating and decide, well, this really isn't the business for me or whatever. I'm, I'm fascinated by that. You know, just to put in a word for the technology thing, in 1977, when I was 15, is when I started learning electronic music. And I was in a class, I think there was another young woman there, it was a summer class at Manus College of Music in Manhattan. And then from there on, every single summer at Aspen, for the two next summers, I, I studied electronic music uh, with Mike, Michael Tchaikovsky on, uh, on, I think it was on Mort Subotnik's uh, Buchla that, uh, that he had lent Mike for the summers. And then after that, when I went to Manhattan School of Music, I studied with Elias Tannenbaum, electronic music. And, it, and this is all along with all the acoustic stuff I was doing. So I was a little electronic rug rat, you know, from, from the very beginning back in the 70s, right? When, when we were still splicing tape in a, a room full of patch cords to, to put everything together just to make a goddamn sine wave. You know, it was horrible <laughs> stuff at the time. Horrible. Um, I, but I, I mean, you, and you, you walk up the, uphill to school both ways, six <laughs> miles. <laughs> right. In my day, we didn't just have our sine waves handed to us by some software. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, all of this is to say, again, now I was the product of, of a cool upbringing, right? Because no one told right. me I couldn't do this and it never occurred to me. And then when, by the time I went to Manhattan School of Music, two of the teachers there, um, Ursula Mamlock, who was my teacher, and uh, Ludmilla Ulela, um, uh, were uh, women. <laughs> That's kind of redundant. Uh, and so, and there were at least three, if not four, out of the six or seven comp students, it was a tiny comp class at the time, this was in the early 80s, uh, half of us were women. So it never occurred to me that this was a weird thing to be doing. Um, I don't know, I just, I missed the dollop of, of, you know, the discrimination thing. And so, and so I read these stories, which I know are true, but I read them wide-eyed. And I look at them in two ways. And one is that, yeah, absolutely, we have to educate the, the idiots out there who still think, you know, uh, what they think. We're dealing with that on a political basis every single day, and we won't even get into politics right now uh, on the show, because that would be a whole lengthy discussion. Mm -hmm. But we're, it's a long uphill battle for women's rights and for the rights of so many people uh, right now in this, in this country, in the United States. But, it, but there, are, there, are two, there are the jerks out there, and then there comes back to the personal responsibility and psychology of realizing that timidity is not going to help you. And one of the points I made on um, Alex's blog, you know, when I commented on her blog post, about, which was about Ellen's, I said, well, the good news is that, you know, I, I, obviously Ellen's article is, is very, very real and very true, but she lists six points uh, that, you know, 
these are the problems. And fully three of them are absolutely fixable by the person themselves, their internal problems. And so that is what points me to always wanting to coach and encourage and help other people, male or female, to feel better about what they're doing. Because if they can whack those problems, you know, if they can just overcome the fear of the ask or the sense of timidity, um, the sense of not being, being good enough, uh, they are going to open up huge doors to themselves, for themselves, and, and be able to use all this technology. The technology is gender blind. There's no reason why anybody who can throw together a few bucks to get a, a laptop, you know, can cannot do all of this, whatever their gender. And and I think it, another part of this is it's very difficult it, to have this conversation for us to say, why aren't these people that are not a part of our group not a part of our group? Right. We like and only <laughs> ask the people in the group. Yeah, um, exactly. Right, I, I, Sam. You, I don't remember if you you might remember this. Sam and I went to graduate school together, and we went to uh, our graduate composition seminar class or whatnot one day and the composition area chair had every, and we were all there were probably 15 composers in the room all of them were undergraduate or graduate and undergraduate composers all of them were men and he asked why aren't there any women here and we're like oh, why are you asking us this question i don't know the answer to that question go ask some women in the hallway why aren't they here why are you in the hallway and not in this room? Like I, I, I don't know how to address that question in in the in from where I'm standing. <laughs> right. No, it's this, and this leads perfectly into the larger issue. Forget about gender and this and that. What about the issue that's currently Greg Sandow's latest post, uh, which has been getting some interesting responses from people, including quite a number of high school students. Um, check it out. I forget the title of the post. It's about the tipping point. Yes. Uh, something about the tipping point. Something about the tipping point well. is coming. And basically, you know, here we are. If you will excuse me, well, all the women in the world, please excuse me for saying this, but we, by talking about gender in new music, we talk about rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, right? I mean, the the issue is actually much bigger about well, what's happening with concert music and how, and we have, you know. We have growing audiences in some ways and diminishing audio audiences in others. And I think we need to take a very good, big, long look at the the genre and, and how do we present it. And this is you know, the point that Greg is making on his blog. And that's that tr even trumps gender and race. You know, we need to talk about race, too, with this. Why is it we are such a white, 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 Caucasian, Caucasian, Caucasian group? You know, that's not cool. And. And there, and it's the same thing. Well, we, it has to do with outreach. It has to do with letting people who are not white and who are not male know that all these opportunities exist for them. And and you know, we we reach out. I know I've been personally involved with organizations where we are very specifically doing that. One of the things I did, I remember back in the days of MySpace, um, and and I guess the translation now would be Facebook. But you know, when when ASCAP was concerned that they had for their young um, young composers awards, I think it was. Uh, they were concerned that they were looking a whole lot of white applicants from a certain economic, you know, place where all these, a lot of these kids had the same teachers and had the same opportunities. And I kind of raised the red flag saying, you know, there's sort of a problem here and there's no reason for that. We should be going on to, at the time, MySpace and now Facebook and letting more people know about this award and letting them know to, to apply. And I think gradually it, it helps if you go to where the people are. As you, the, 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 that David, that comment is priceless about the teacher asking in the room, why aren't there any women here? You know, you got to go out to the hallway. So that's what every organization has to do. And every individual who cares about the issue of, of whatever non-white combination of traits we're looking to bring into the, under the tent, you know, which is everybody, um, go, we got to get out of the tent. Right. Got to get out. Of and it's about it's about education. Whether when, when we talk about education, you, we usually literally mean you know a teacher in a classroom talking to young people, but education also in the sense of outreach, talking to people that are adults but have just just don't know about the things that we do. Um, so yeah, and and we'll probably get into Sandow's piece in a little bit more detail next week. We're running a little long already. Um, but I want to get to our pick of the week, um, which is going to be, I think I, we decided to go with Beneath, which is a movement from uh, right. a, a larger work by our guest, Alex Gardner. But before we do that, I do want to mention this just happened this afternoon. Um, in fact, if we had recorded this show this morning as we at our normal time, we would not have gotten this news story. Um, 
Bud Herseth passed away today, the great principal trumpet player of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra for over 50 years, the first and, and I believe t- to this day only uh, orchestral musician, section musician that has been given the League of American Orchestra's gold baton, um, was kind of one of the defining musicians of orchestral sound in, in the 20th century and beyond. And, you know, I, I grew up as a trumpet player wanting to be Bud Herseth. Um, you know, he's the guy that we all play C trumpet for in orchestras now instead of B flat to sound just like him. Um, so he will certainly be missed. I had the privilege of, of hearing him play just in a master class of some orchestral excerpts uh, after he had retired from the CSO about 10 years ago. And uh, it's just, just an amazing, amazing man who had an incredible career. So yep. uh, listen yeah. to some listen to some live Chicago Symphony r- recordings from the 80s and 90s and have your mind blown boom, boom, by boom, that boom, principal boom, trumpet. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, we should point out really quick that um, we've talked a lot about gender and gender identity and stuff, but one thing proven conclusively today is that if you have two men who can't make it to work, the thing to do is call one woman and have her fill in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Now, when you guys, when you guys are playing beneath, um, which is from Immersion, it's the third movement of, of my Symphony of FSC Immersion. I'm going to start pointing the camera. I'm going to walk outside That's and give you guys perfect. a tour. Okay. That's so perfect. So I'm going to start moving around. So do you have anything you want to say before we before we get going and playing it Bef- about the piece? About the piece, uh, or do you want to sure. let it speak well, for itself? Well, we, but what, you're, what you guys are going to hear um, is uh, just an excerpt of a, a three movement work, uh, a symp- an electroacoustic uh, band piece for winds and percussion, and a pre recorded track. And in the case of Beneath, uh, the guest of honor, the, it's a concerto for uh, a band and a Pacific Humpback Whale. <laughs> and, and it was a joy to, um, to you know, envelop all these different, different sounds uh, together. As a matter of fact, Yale University just did a live stream of, of their performance of it of this piece on uh, Friday night, yeah. two nights ago. And the recording that you're going to hear is from its first of the, of the consortium premieres uh, a couple of years ago, I think now almost, uh, with the University of Minnesota, Jerry Lucard conducting. And they, they play beautifully. So you can find, if you go to my website, alexhipper.org, and you go to a, type in immersion, and you can uh, hear much more and you know, read about the piece. It was a joy to write this ode to the sea, because if... As, as a lot of people know from reading my blog, Notes from the Kelp, if I hadn't been a musician, I would probably have been a marine biologist. <laughs> so I really love uh, all the squishy, wonderful things around me. And it was a great opportunity to be given the chance to, to set the squishiness to music. So all right. I'm going to walk around and show you stuff. Yeah, go for it. All right.
So that was an excerpt from uh, Immersion by our guest, Alex Shapiro. Alex, thank you so much for sharing that music with us, and thank you for sharing uh, your <laughs> your beautiful vista with us. Thank you. This has been really fun. I love talking to you guys, and I think you do a great show. Well, thank so. you very much. That means a lot. It was a, it was a great piece. I love, I love you framing it as a concerto for the whale. <laughs> um, because you really get that not only that sense of dialogue between the band and the the recorded sounds, but when they're both playing, so to speak, the the band sounds really kind of envelop the 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 recorded whale in a really interesting. Like you can tell that they're not competing; that one is is kind of surrounding the other in a nice warm hug. Thank you. That is a wonderful thing to say because my whole goal with all the electroacoustic pieces I write, and particularly the ones with band, is that one shouldn't know where the digital audio and the band begin and end. It should be one beautiful, amorphous, you know, ent- musical sound entity. And uh, so, thank you. <laughs> you. That's great that I accomplished that. <laughs> Getting the whale into the studio was very difficult, let me tell you. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and very particular, had to have just the right kind of, of, of corn <laughs> chips. And uh, it had a very complicated rider, I'm sure. I, I had to keep it in wild salmon, which basically I'm kept in wild salmon out here. I mean, people, as you can see behind me, people fish, you know, right behind me, literally bring it up on their boats, come on over, and we put it on the grill here. That's life in the San Juans. It's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. It sounds, it so, sounds just terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. Come out and visit. I always say to everybody, come out and visit. I make a really good island docent. I love driving people around in circles. There's a lot of stuff to see here, including a lot of whales. Not, not that we have some humpbacks, but mostly the orca whales are what we're uh, uh, famous for here. And, um, and they come right, right here, right out here, uh, is where they feed in front of me. I could wow. almost reach out and touch them. I call them my floating pandas. So <laughs> come, and, <laughs> come and visit. <laughs> That's great. Listen, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. It was really great talking to you. If you have anything coming up that you want to plug... This is the place to do it. Let it, let anybody know where they can uh, hear your music or get to your get to your stuff. Well, again, keeping with our uh, conversation, the best thing, uh, given the fact that this is going to be an archived thing, rather than tell you what's going on currently, come to my website, alexshapiro.org. Hear whatever you want to hear. Love it, hate it, respond. You'll see a lot of photographs of uh, that I take. I'm an amateur photographer, nature photographer, so you can uh, kind of immerse yourself in this world. So, thank you. That's great, <laughs> and of course. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us on very short notice. Uh, it was great having you on the show. Do you have anything coming up that you want to plug? Um, one thing, in if you are in uh, the North Texas region, um, my improvis- improvising group, um, Impulse, will be performing at Panhandle House in, um, in Denton, Texas on Friday, April 26th, and we'll be performing um, a piece by Patrick Perringer, uh, one of our guitarists. Great. Excellent. And, and great. it was great to have you on the show again as well. That's it was great to do be. it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we need to uh, talk over you. Um, that's going to do it for this week's issue this week's edition of sound notion uh thank you to everybody who watched live we really appreciate you joining us you can anybody can watch the show live we normally do the show at 11 a.m eastern time um so tune into soundnotion.tv slash live and check that out you can of course always download the show after the fact um anytime you want at soundnotion.tv slash sn and you can of course comment on the show there as well we would love to not have these conversations end when i turn off the recording we would love for them to continue onto the web just all the wonderful things about the web that we talked about today uh should continue with all of these topics that we've talked about today you can find us as a group um uh on Facebook or Twitter. We're at Sound Notion on Twitter. I'm at Dave McDow. Sam is at Housegoy. Alex is at Alex underscore Shapiro. Um, and Sarah does not yet tweet, as far as I know. But when she does, uh, when the, I'm sure by the it's sometime in the future when the, that's, you're watching that's this one archive of my boundaries. recording. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, 
Perhaps, perhaps someday you'll be able to find Sarah on on the on the Twitter machine. Uh, you can subscribe to this show on iTunes and get every episode downloaded to your device uh, automatically. And you can find us wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. Uh, if you'd like to support our show, go to the site. Uh, there's an Amazon affiliate link on the right side, and you won't see any difference if you go there to search for your stuff to buy on Amazon because who doesn't buy everything on Amazon? I know I do, uh, but we'll get a tiny little commission and that helps us out a lot. And you can uh, support us there directly as well. Sound Notions introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching and we will see you back next week. Madman on AMC.